Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Akif, uh, and welcome to RUCP for spring semester. Uh, and okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, Mo's algorithm. Um, Mo's algorithm is really really cool, so I hope you guys enjoy this lecture. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start out with a motivating problem, an example problem to uh, sort of introduce the idea. Okay, so we have some array x of size n. Uh, it's an array of like numbers, okay, and we're given a bunch of queries, okay, uh, and these queries are the form uh, two numbers L R, which denote some subarray in your original array, so the endpoints of a subarray, um, and the query asks for you to find the mode of that subarray. Um, so mode, in case you guys aren't familiar, uh, means the most common element. Um, it, so do you want the most com the element that appears the most times in that subarray? Um, and you can have, uh, as you may realize, multiple answers for this, right? You can have multiple items which are the most common in that subarray. Uh, if that happens, just return any of them, any of the most common ones, okay? Um, an in important point to note is that you can answer these queries offline. So when I say offline, that means that you don't have to uh, process the query, give the answer, and then get the next query. So like, if it was online, the opposite of this, right? They would ask you one query, you respond with your answer, and then they would give you the next query. Uh, if it's off, since it's offline, uh, the the tester will just give you all the queries, and then you can just give all the answers back at the end. Okay, and so that lets you like sort of uh, be smarter about answering the queries, maybe. Okay. Um, as an example, take this as the array. So this this is the original array x. Okay, and if you're given the query one four, so one four means one two uh, zero one, so starting here, and one two three four. So you see, we have two appears twice, and five and six appear once. Uh, so the uh, answer here is two, because two appears the most times in that subarray, okay? So uh, everyone clear on what the problem is? Someone has a question? Okay, yes, okay, cool. Um, okay. Um, so if you're familiar with like other ways to answer sort of range queries, di different types of problems for range queries, uh, you might think of like sec trees or something. But sec trees really, sec trees and other similar ideas really don't seem to work here, because or, or like sparse table or anything like that, because there really isn't a way to sort of combine the information from like ha one half of the array and the other half of the array. So there's no way to combine that information um, to understand what the, the mode, the new entire array is going to be, um, without having to store. ON information. Uh, there, there really doesn't seem to be a way to do that. Um, even, even a merge sort tree, uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with the sec tree lecture, really doesn't work here for, for the same reason. Right. So what can we do? Okay, so instead of tackling this seemingly very difficult problem, we're going to attack a simplified problem, simplified version of the problem, okay? An easier version. So instead of answering range queries or anything, we're going to answer much simpler uh, type of queries, okay? Uh, and these queries have three different types of queries in this, pro in this new problem. Um, you're given an add query, so you're given a number and told to add it to your sort of container. Uh, you're given a delete number query, okay? And then you're given um, an actual query query, so get the mode, like, like we were doing before, right? So you have some data structure we want to make, which can a you can add a number to that data structure, you can remove a number from the data structure, and you can query the mode of that data structure, okay? Um, everyone clear on what this new problem is? Okay, so can we solve this fast? Uh, any ideas on this? Yeah, priority queue, exactly. Um, so you can use a priority queue reset to solve this problem in login. Right? Um, and th the way you would do that is you would just sort of store the frequencies, and then you would have a priority queue of a uh, keyed by frequency of each, of each type of number. Right. So for each number, you have like frequency comma actual number, and you store that on the priority queue or a set, or like a balanced binary binary tree. Right. And either of those would solve the problem in log n. Right. Uh, with a with a priority queue, you have to be lazy, I think. But with a set, you don't have to be lazy. But I, either one solves it in log n and is fine. Um, uh, there is actually a constant time solution for this, by the way, involving li linked lists. Um, and by the way, I just want to emphasize this has nothing to do with Mo's algorithm or anything, this constant time solution. But I think it's really cool that there is a constant time solution. So I'm going to go over that real quick, just because it's cool and a matter of curiosity more than anything to do with actual Mo's algorithm. Okay? 
Um, so uh, for, for this, you'll have to first uh, coordinate compress all the, the the original array. So if the original array has like elements usually from like zero to like ten to the ninth or something, you'll have to sort of compress them into uh, by replace them by their sort of uh, smaller range of values from one to n, from like one to ten to the fifth or whatever, whatever it was reasonable, right? So you can just do that because the the actual numbers don't matter, right? Only thing that matters is how often they show up, right? So you can just replace them by, by an initial sorting with just some other set of numbers, which are sort of compressed in a much smaller range. Okay, so but or, or if this is sort of confusing to you, just assume that the original problem gives you numbers in the range from one to n and not any bigger than that. Okay, so if you have this, then you can solve this in O1. So the way you do that is instead of just storing like in in, in this easy pro easy uh, solution, right? You would store a list of um, or, or a map from the actual number to the count, right? So you store that here too. You store a, a map from the, or a list, or an array from the number itself to the count. But on top of that, you also store um, sort of a, a map or an array of the, uh, of the count to all the numbers that show up in that count. So for all possible counts, you keep a linked list of numbers with that count. Uh, then uh, adding or deleting from the, the entire data structure it's just moving an item from from the link from one link list to another, to either before it to the one like to the left if you're removing an item, or moving that item from that link list to the one above it uh, if you're adding an item. Um, and the way you would need to do this is you need to keep a, you need to keep a pointer pointing from each possible number to its link list node. And so if you keep that pointer, then you can sort of get to that pointer, delete it from the original link list, and then move it to one of the other ones. Um, Additionally, you need to keep a max count. So this is the max the link list with the biggest count that's full, that, that's not empty. So like if for, you have all the possible counts, right? So if you're like this thing shows up once, this thing shows up twice, this thing shows up thrice, fourth, whatever, right? And at the at the biggest one that's not empty, you keep track of that with a max count. Um, and notice that this can only increase or decrease by one at a time. So if you if you move if you have one item here at the max and move it to the left, that becomes empty. But max count only shifts left by one, so that's okay, and that's still a one. And so you can shift either right or left by one, and so you keep max count updated. Um, and then the query operation is just outputting any uh, item from the link list at the max count. So just you can output ahead of that or something. Um, and so all these are constant time operations, and so the entire thing is constant time. Um, any questions about this? Uh, it's not crucial for you to understand this. It was just something cool, I thought. Wait, how do you keep the pointer from the number to the point in the linked list? So like an actual pointer to the node, right? So if you have the linked list, you can keep a literal just like pointer, like a, like a node star. Um, you, but I mean, like, how do you access the number? How do you store the number in an array? So, so you have an array of all the numbers, right? Because they're compressed, or you're, you're going to assume the numbers are from 1 to 10 to the 5th, right? 0 to 10 to the 5th. So you have an array oh, oh. of size 10 to the 5th. So, it's so it, only, it only works if they're from 1 to 10 to the 5th. Yeah, 1 to, one to some reasonable end value. So, but, but that's fine, okay. because you can always coordinate compress. You can only do this. Um, you can't do this with like interactive problems, though, right? Because you can't coordinate compress. Yeah, that's kind of what I meant. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But remember, the whole thing is that this is offline, right? So. But but yeah, you're right. If it was online, you could. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um, so, uh, just yeah. So we have we have some solution to this simplified problem. Okay. Either in login or no. So now uh, I'm going to introduce the really smart part of this. It's called Mo's comparator. Okay. Um, and so what Mo does, Mo's comparator does is that it splits the array into blocks of size square root n. So I'm going to call uh, square root n equals s here. I'm going to denote that by s. And then we're going to think of splitting the array into blocks of that size. Okay. Uh, then we're going to sort the queries in this very specific way. So the way we sort it is by this. So first we sort it by which block the left endpoint appears in. So we index all the blocks from block one, block two, block three, so on and so forth. And we see which block the left endpoint of that query appears in. Then secondarily, we sort just by the right endpoint. Okay. Um, and so uh, now that we've sorted it, what can we do? So uh, assume that, let's say, we've loaded the data structures with one of the query ranges. So let's say take the first query in our sorted order. Um, and we've loaded all its numbers. So it has some numbers, right? It's from AL, from L to R, right? It has, it has the numbers in the array from L to R. And we can load that into our data structure by just calling add a bunch of times, right? Um, then to get the next query, to move from one query, load it to the next query, what we can do 
is we can sort of shrink and expand the left and right endpoints by, add, by calling add and delete on our data structure. Okay? Uh, I'll give, I'm gonna sh uh, before any, have any questions, I'm going to explain uh, how, like, with an example how this works specifically. Okay? So, okay, so we're given a whole, these, a whole bunch of queries. So here, n equals 16. Okay? So if from uh, 1 to 16. Um, and we have these, these bunch of queries. Okay? So since uh, n is 16, s equals square root of n uh, is 4. Right? So we have blocks of size 4, and we have 4 blocks of size 4. Um, and so it looks like this. So 1 block, 2 block, 3 block, 4 block, right? Okay, so we've separated it. Now uh, we sort all these queries by which block they appear in, their left endpoint appears in. So if you see here, 1 and 3 appear in block 1. 5 and 6 appear in block 2. 9 and 9 appear in this block, and 13 appears in this very last block. Okay, cool? Um, then we can secondarily sort within each sort of row uh, by the increasing order of the right endpoint. Okay. So uh, notice that this will sort of screw up the sorting of the left endpoints um, within each uh, row, but that's okay. Um, so what happens here? Right. So the sort of these two are still in the same block; they're in the block one, and the sort the right endpoints are sorted. So it's eight, twelve, right? Here, these guys are in the same block. Their left endpoints are backwards, but it's okay. Their right endpoints are the actual sorting once you're in the same block. Okay, you see, so 9, 15, and then this is the only one. Okay. Uh, everyone clear on what the comparator is doing? Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. So now let's move on to processing the queries in the example. Okay. So assume we've answered the first query, 3.8. We've loaded 3.8 into our data structure uh, with a bunch of ads, and now we're moving on to the second query. Remember, the second query after 3.8 is 1.12, right? Okay, so what do we do? So we can shift the left and right pointers. So first, we can move from 3 to 1. So we can take this 3, right? So the point left pointer starts out at 3, and we shift left. So we call add twice more. And now this left pointer is at 1. So we've included 1 and 2 into our data structure by calling add. Uh, then we can move the right pointer, which starts at 8, into 12 by calling add four more times. So we call add, we call add, we call add, we call add. And now we've sort of expanded this uh, query to include both, uh, to, this, to, to now include the elements for this next new query. Right? Um, and, and now if we want to go from this to now 6.6, six, we'll have to call, we'll have to, instead of calling add, we'll have to call delete a bunch of times. So we'll have to call delete here, the right endpoint delete, so meow, here, meow, 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 meow. And then the, the left end point from 1 to meow, 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 a whole bunch of deletes. And then you'll have just 6, 6. Okay? And then we, we, we do this for all the queries. We, we just loop through all the queries in this new sorted order um, and just keep on shrinking and expanding to, uh, until we've answered all the queries. Make sense? Okay, uh, so this seems kind of weird. Why are we doing it? This, this sorting, this sorting method, uh, order seems really weird, and how does this help us? Um, so to show why this helps, I'm go we're going to now uh, spend a couple slides fully analyzing the time complexity of this algorithm. Okay. Uh, so when I say this algorithm, I mean uh, we s the, the specific algorithm is we sort by this comparator, and then we process all the queries in that order using this shift, expand, contract thing. Okay. So. Uh, to start off, we're going to analyze the complexity of the left side. So we're going to look at the left endpoint only. We're going to ignore the right endpoint and only look at the left endpoint, okay? And see what it does as it shifts left. Uh, the left endpoint shifts, like expand or contract, okay? So if two queries are in the same block, right? Uh, the left endpoint shifts at most square root n, right? It shifts at most s, right? Uh, everyone see that? Because the blocks are of a size square root n, so if you're in the same block, you can at most only move with square root of n distance, right? Whether that be add or contract. Okay, uh, and this happens at most once. The square root of n shifting happens once for each of the Q queries. Okay. Um, now, uh, if we move from one block to the next block, right? Because remember, these are sorted in order of the of the, the blocks at the left end points in, right? So we're, we're we're we start out by being in this block, right? These guys are in this block. Then we'll be in this block. So we move from this block, and then we move here. And then we do this block, and then we move here. And then we do this block, and then we move here, and then we do this block, right? 
So the moving from one block to the next, the left expands or contracts at most only two root n, uh, right? Because one block is the size root n, so both of them together is at most two root n. So from one from all the way to the left to all the way to the right is at most two root n. Um, however, we sort of accounted for a root n over here. So it's at most only root n more extra on top of what we did in this previous bullet point. Okay? And since there's only square root n blocks, right? Uh, and so then it will only have uh, square, root of, square root of n transitions from one block to the next block to the next block to the next block, right? So only, only, that much <coughs> only that many blocks exist. Um, and so this extra shifting for the transitions uh, is, oh, is that much. It's square root of n extra square root of n times, right? So now we add all these, both of these up, both these bullet points up, and we get that the total amount that the left endpoint shifts is oh, square root of n times square root of n for the extra shifting transition amount plus q root n, because q times uh, number of queries and the, the root n shifting within each uh, block. Right, so this uh, uh, root n times root n is just n. So it becomes n plus q root n, okay? Any questions at all? I can like draw a picture or something uh, more if you guys need, uh, but I don't know. Uh, any questions at all, I guess? No? Okay, well, let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to tackle the right side, the right endpoint, okay? So now consider all the queries with the left side within a given block, right? So we're going to consider, let's say, all of these queries, all the queries in the red block, for example, right? Uh, so in that case, remember that within a given block for the left endpoint, the right endpoints are just sorted normally, right? Um, and so there, that right endpoint sweeps from left to right. It sweeps the entire array from left to right once because it's, it's an increasing order, right? Um, so it, every sort of block for the left endpoint, it, it the right endpoints cover the entire array in its, in its sweep. Okay. Um, so additionally, uh, every time the block transitions, so every time we go from, let's say, the red block to the orange block, right? Um, we go from the we, we have to reset the right endpoint. So the re, re, right endpoint goes from having a big value at the end of the red block to having a really small value at the beginning of the orange block, right? So then it needs to go it needs to go from all the way to the right to all the way to the left to sort of reset and then increase sweep again the entire array, right? So sort of for every block it does sort of two runs of the entire array, one for the actual sweep and one for the reset, right? And so that's two n operations, two n adds initially and then contracts for the reset, right? Um, and then times the number of blocks, and there's how many blocks? Only root n blocks, right? So overall, this is O n root n. So the right side only does O n root n uh, as or contracts. Okay? Any questions on this? No? Okay, let's keep going. So now let's put these two together. So in summary, uh, the left endpoint takes n plus q root, q, q root n, whereas the right takes O of n root n, right? So if you add these two together, uh, you get this. Um, n is dominated by n root n, so that goes away. And this becomes big O of n root n plus q root n, which factors as uh, n plus q times root n shifts. Okay? So for this mode problem, remember, uh, we had the, the, nice, the easy way is that each shift, uh, each operation takes log n steps. Right, log, log n time, right? So overall, this is n plus q root n log n uh, time. Um, this is just on the border of being the past. Depends on how efficiently you write your uh, your operations. Like maybe a priority queue will pass, but a, st a stud set might not pass, or something like that. I'm not sure. So it's just right on the border of passing, right? Um, so whatever. Um, and then if you uh, and if you use the O1 variant that I mentioned before with the linked list, that that just becomes n plus q times root n which passes very quickly. Yeah. Okay. And so this is very nice, right? Just by having this really weird sorting order, right? Then we can just go ahead and answer these queries seemingly naively answer these queries just in this really weird order. And all of a sudden we're in this very passable time limit that's subquadratic, which is really cool. Uh, Cool? Okay. 
let's keep going. Okay, uh, so this is an implementation for the for the mode problem, right? So uh, we start out by setting Q to just be the indexes of the queries. There's a few ways you can implement it. This is the way I like to do it: is you just fill Q with the indexes of the query from zero to Q, you from zero to like the actual number of queries, right? Um, and then we sort it. We sort it in the the way that I mentioned before, using most comparator, right? So uh, let's see how this is most comparator. So, uh, so oh by the way, we stored L and uh, L and R uh, for each query globally. So we stored the endpoints for each I globally, right? So how do we sort it? We say okay, take like the left endpoint of that query and divide by S. So that gives a block we're in. The floor div gives the block we're in. Um, and if uh, the 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 blocks that the left endpoints of these queries are in are not equal, then we just sort by that. Right, we just sort by the which block it is. Otherwise, if we're in the same block, if the left endpoints are in the same block, then we just sort by the right endpoint. Right. Um, okay. And then now we start out this range. So cur l to cur r is the range we have, and this starts out as empty. Right. This is an empty range. Uh, then we loop over all queries, uh, and this is in the order that we just sorted by. And then we just naively sort of do it. We just um, if the right endpoint needs to go to the right, it needs to go even further right, then we just add and, and, and increase it. If the right endpoint needs to shrink, it needs to go left, we just delete and shrink. Right? And, and remember, x, x was the original array. So we, we take that item and add it. We take the item and delete it. Um, if the left endpoint needs to increase even further, uh, sorry, no, if, you, if it needs to shrink by going to the right, uh, we just shrink it. We delete until it doesn't need to anymore. If it needs to expand by going even more to the left, we just let it do that by adding. And then finally, we just t store the answer for that query um, by just calling the query function on our uh, data structure for mode, for our mode data structure. Uh, and at the end, we would just print out all the answers for the query in, or in order. So just from uh, i equals 0 to, 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 to max q, and then print out uh, just ansi. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this was for the mode problem. Um, as you probably can see, this has nothing very specific to do with mo the mode problem itself, and it so it generalizes very easily to a huge set of problems. Um, so, if in in general, if we have some array with n elements, and we're given q offline queries on ranges l i to r i, and we have some data structure with add delete and query contents, so there's operations of adding to the data structure, uh, deleting the data structure, and answering this type of query on the contents of the data structure, exactly like you did for mode, in t of n time, in o of t of n time, then we can sort all the queries with most comparator, um, and then answer all the queries um, in that order, which will, answering all the queries in that order uh, with the data structure, will only take n plus q times root n t of n time. That's so exactly what we did for mode. It's just I'm expressing it in a general way here. Okay. Okay. Um, so a couple of things to note here about Mo's algorithm. Um, first off, is that uh, s setting s exactly square root of n might not be the best thing, depending on the specifics of the exact problem or like how long each operations take. Um, uh, I want to emphasize here that this is nothing specifically to do with Mo's algorithm. Any sort of problem where you have like square root decomposition type stuff happening, um, depending on the, the sort of constant factor on each side of the square root, um, it may be better or worse to sort of make the actual sort of square instead of using the square root itself uh, to use like maybe a, a few multiples of the square root, like uh, two times the square root or three times the square root or something like that. And, and this is something that happens in all square root decomposition problems. Um, so here specifically, um, instead of using s equals square root of n, the, the more general uh, time complexity is q at times s, which is s is the block size here. So it's the, whatever, if you set x or whatever the block size is, um, you get q times s plus n squared over s. Um, and so if uh, all operations cost the same, this the optimal this optimizes to be the smallest at uh, s equals n over root q, not uh, not just root n. Um, so, and then if the operation is different, just like, I don't know, it's up to the problem specifics. Um, this is not something that will matter a huge amount. Most of the time, Q and N are the same, and 
you should have ample time and the time complexity to pass, but it's something to keep in mind if you're trying to squeeze it under the time limit. Uh, just, it can give you quite a big factor of improvement if you do this, if you keep this in mind. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that instead of an actual class or data structure like I had with the mode, like I had in the in the previous slide with the mode code, um, I prefer to instead define a function called update, which takes in the index that I'm updating that I'm either inserting or deleting. Um, and then get pass it either plus or minus one to indicate whether I'm uh, adding or deleting it. Um, and then this update function ins would instead of having, would just update the actual answer globally. So then when I actually need to get the answer to the query, I just look at a global variable. Um, the last thing to keep in mind, um, or to, to note, is that as I mentioned before, the right endpoint not only sweeps per block from the left all the way to the right, when it transitions to the next block, it has to sort of reset, right? It's a reset to the all the way to the left, right? And so we get sort of two n uh, sweeps per block, two n covers operations for the block, uh, for the right endpoint per block, right? However, a, a, a very cute and nice thing we can do is that instead of sorting in the same direction every block, we can sort in a uh, decreasing order for every odd block, and an increasing order for for every even block. Uh, so you can think of this of the the right endpoint as sort of snaking, so it like it it goes meow, and then on the on the next block instead of having to reset, it just goes the other way. It sorts the other way, and it just sort of sort of snakes back and forth. But every even block, odd block, even block, odd block, and in practice, uh, this is like almost twice as fast in, in, depending on the problem. So it's really really nice, and it's a very small change in code. Okay, so uh, this is sort of more general implementation for most algorithm using these notes that I mentioned in the previous slide. So here you can see that uh, instead of just always sorting the right endpoint in one direction, I switch which way I sort it, depending on if uh, the block uh, I index is odd or even. Right? So that, that's that change. And additionally here, you can see instead of using the data structure, I just call update with either plus or minus one. And then here, instead of calling any query function, I just set it to whatever the global answer is. Um, occasionally, there won't you will have to have some sort of query function because the answer won't be like readily available. You'll have to actually do some operations to, to get the answer, and in that case, you can just call some query function that's also stored somewhere. It also, it also just exists globally, and that's fine too. Okay. Uh, any questions on this implementation or what I was saying with the snaking? No? Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to give the an update function for the mode implementation, just so you see what's what's happening there. This is for the this is the O log n version which uses set. Okay. Uh, so we're updating by adding an index, we're adding or deleting an index, and D tells you whether or not we're adding or deleting, right? So we look at the value at that index, right? So we look at the value. And then we uh, do a couple things. First, so best sort is a set which stores frequency, comma, uh, like value pairs, right? So we remove the frequency value pair from it for this current value. Then we change the value. So count is how many times uh, that value appears. So we either plus one, if d is plus one, we increase it, or if d is negative one, we decrease it, right? So, which is correct. And then we add it back into best. So here you see we've updated best to account to have the new frequency for a, as opposed to the old one. Um, and then tot, which is sort of the final answer, the query answer, currently is just sort of the R begin, which is the, the biggest value in the set. This, and remember, this is the biggest count, the biggest sort of count valued guy in the set. And then we look at his value by taking the second. We look, we look at the guy in the set with the biggest uh, count, and then we take his value. Is this clear? In case you're getting familiar, R begin is literally just the opposite of begin. It gives the biggest guy instead of the smallest guy in the set. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, oh, it's just, this is something just interesting to mention. I'm not going to go into depth about this at all, but something cool to mention. Uh, we talked about like uh, the original Mohs comparator, and then I talked about like the snaking Mohs comparator, right? 
Um, there's actually other even better comparators that exist that, that do the same thing, but just like even less operations. Um, here's uh, a link to a blog on one of them. It's sort of like called, we call it the Hilbert curve comparator. Uh, and so this blog like uses all sorts of cool topics in CS, including the traveling salesman problem and Hilbert curve, the 2D Hilbert curve. And this gives a time, compl time complexity as opposed to n plus q times root n. It makes the time complexity n root q. And times off Tn. Um, personally, for the problems I tried it on, I didn't see much of an improvement. But this guy's benchmarked it on some other problems, and he sees an improvement. Uh, I guess I, um, and uh, and apparently it's supposed to really give an improvement of when q is much less than n, much smaller than n. Um, it's a lot more code, though, so I don't know. Uh, just uh, take a look if you guys. It's really cool and interesting, but in terms of actual use, uh, just guess it's a personal judgment call, I guess, and depends on the specific problem. But I highly recommend checking the blog out if you have the time, because it uses all sorts of cool like uh, topics in, in CS for this, for this just this most algorithm. Okay. Okay. okay uh, so now let's get started with some problems. Okay. And, and before I get started, just a couple. Uh, any any questions at all uh, on what I covered so far? Keep on going. Feel free to interrupt me if anything is confusing. Okay. Okay, this problem is called powerful array. So we're given an array of size 2 times 10 to the fifth, uh, where the elements are of size uh, 1 to the sixth, up, uh, up to. And we define for any array like this, uh, k sub s is the number of occurrences of the num of, of, of s. It's like s is some integer, and k, and k sub s is how many times it appears in that array. Okay. And so the power of any given array is defined as the sum of s times k sub s squared across all the distinct s in that array. Okay. Um, and then we're also given like up to 2 times 10 to the fifth queries of the form LR. And what we need to do is output the power of the subarray from L to R, subarray of A from L to R. Okay. Uh, so look at, let's look at an example. Uh, so if A is this whole big array, and then we query from 2 to 7. So 2 to 7 is this red, these red items. Uh, this is one index here. So it's from 2 to 7. So this is red guys. Then we see here that 1 shows up thrice. So k sub 1 is 3. So we get 1 times k sub 1 squared. So 1 times 3 squared. Uh, k sub 2 is 2 because it shows up twice. So it's 2 times k sub 2 squared. Like this. And 3 shows up 1. So k sub 3 is 1. So we get 3 times 1 to the 1. So it becomes 9 times 8 plus 3. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's yeah. So uh, nine times nine plus eight plus three, which is twenty. Okay. Is this clear? Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh. So yeah. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to think of any ideas on how to solve.
just a hint, so this is a lecture on Mohs algorithm, so uh, and Mohs algorithm is pretty specific on what you need to do, so and you have to use hint you have to use that. Um, so think of like what data structure you'll be using. How can you make a data structure uh, that satisfies what you need for Mohs algorithm to apply? And how can you do that efficiently? Um, so, yeah, so what would you do with a map? You, uh, you store the count of each element, and then when you add it, you, rem you update the map at that element's position, and then first you subtract the current thing. So, like, if, if three currently has one occurrence, you subtract three times one, and then you, um... Am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, yeah you're just... Oh, you square it. Yeah. Wait, but for the... Never mind. Um, and then and then you add the the updated occurrence. Uh, yeah, that's, ex that's exactly correct. Um, uh, this will be like whatever most complexity of uh, Q plus N root N times log N for the map. However, note that I mentioned that AI is up to uh, one, uh, 1 times uh, 10 to the 6, right? So then you don't actually don't even need the map. You can just store the occurrences in an array. So like that gives you the log factor. You see that? Uh, and, and even if it wasn't, you could coordinate compress it again, and that again gives you the log factor. You kind of want to shy away from doing uh, n root n times log n because if, like, for example, if you take ten to the fifth, right? Uh, what does that become? Uh, that becomes. Right, that, that becomes 5 times 10 to the 8th, right? And so if the constant factors are bad at all, uh, then you're TLEing with like even just 10 to the 5th. Forget, forgetting even 2 times 10 to the 5th, which is like, um, which this is, right? And that like almost certainly TLE for uh, n root n log n. Um, but you have the right answer, just the log factor can be getting rid of. And then, and then you're definitely uh, passing in time, okay? Yeah, so this is the next slide is basically exactly what David said. Um, so. Uh, our Mohs data structure can maintain uh, the count of how many times each number appears in the current range that m your data structure is encompassing. And then when we update the count, we can update the total answer. Um, and the way we do that and this is through this very common pattern that you'll see um, both in Mohs algorithm problems and in general just throughout CP when you're sort of updating these counts, uh, that when you're updating like sum of contributions in, uh, of, in, in a way. So it's exactly what David said, is where you subtract the power of that element using this formula, using the formula here, from the total. You update the count, and then you add back the power to, to the total. And so here, let me show you the code so you understand it better. So as I mentioned here before, instead of the map, you can just use an array and give it a log factor. Because 10 to the 6 is fine, so there's an array of size 10 to the 5th. And you have this total sum, which starts out as zero, total power sum, right? Then when we add uh, AI to it, add or delete AI to it, we subtract the current power, by this, which is given by this formula. We update the count, either by plus one or minus one, depending on what D is. And then we increase the count by the, the, the new power, and increase the total by the new power, which is by this formula again. Is this clear? Next problem. Okay, so this is called Zor in favor number. So we have an array uh, A again up to at most containing elements at most ten to the six, and it's a size up to ten to the fifth. Okay, ten to the fifth. Um, and we have some favorite number K up to ten to the six. Okay. Then we're given a bunch of queries uh, up to ten to the fifth of these of the form L to R. Right. So again, subarrays L to R. And the question is, how many subarrays of this given subarray A from L to R. So the subarray A from L to R, and when we're looking of subarrays of that subarray, okay? And the question is, how many subarrays of this subarray have a Zor sum equal to K? Uh, so by Zor sum, I just mean you take all the elements and Zor them together, okay? 
as an example, look at this. This is an array of A, and so let's say K equals 3, okay? So then if we're given the query 2 to 6, so 2 to 6 is one index, so it's 2, the so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then the answer is 4, because 4 uh, subarrays of this subarray have a ZOR sum of 4, uh, so a ZOR sum of 3, sorry. Uh, for example, uh, I'll just give, let's throw them all to here. So these are all the, the ones that do it. So 2, 3, so this subarray of two elements, has a ZOR sum of 3, because 2 ZOR 1 is 3. Then from 3 to 6 has a ZOR sum of 3, because 1 ZOR 1 ZOR 0 ZOR 3, so 1 and 1 cancel out, and then you just get 3. Uh, 5 6 gives 3, because 0 ZOR 3 is just 3. And then 6 6, because just 3 itself has a ZOR sum of 3. Okay? Have you understand? Yeah, so I guess take take a few minutes. Uh, try to think of uh, not just full answers. This is a slightly more difficult problem than the previous one. So any any sort of approach or, or idea you have or, or observation, uh, I'd just like say that. Um, the brute force like solution, you could have like a set of all the ZOR sums. And then when you add something, um, you keep that set and then you ZOR everything, every element in that set and add that to the set. But I, I don't know how to handle deletes. So that's still N squared ZOR sums though, right? Yeah. I'm saying it's just like a brute force. Yeah, yeah sure. Hint, uh, like think of, of a different way to sort of re-express the idea of a ZOR sum. So think about that maybe. It's not bit mask as far as I know. Maybe there is a bit mask solution, but I don't know of any bit mask solution. Wait, you create a prefix sum for each possible. Wait, no, never mind. You're very much on the right track. Wait, I always forget. Is subarrays like the same thing as substrings, or is it like subsets? It's like substring, yeah. Oh, it's like substring.
Wait, then can't you um? You can do prefix sum, and then you have to see if any of the two of the prefix sums Zorda Zorda K. So you just have to see if um. You just have to see if the one that you added. Hold on. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you, you, have, you have the next slide, so let me show that one at least. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as David said, so instead of looking at the actual array, we can look at the partial Zor sums of the array, the partial sums, right? And I'm calling that PI here instead of AI. Um, so then the Zor sum of the subarray from A from I to J is just PI Zor PJ because Zor cancels itself out, right? So this is, this is a very nice trick. Shouldn't that be uh, p i minus one or p j? I think. Maybe. You want to sort of x out all the stuff before your subarray, right? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're right. I, I don't know. Cause I, I did the partial sums with like z like uh, like I did the partial sums with the zero initially. That's why. Like the, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a there's a there's a few different ways to express this depending on what your partial sums actually represent. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, yeah. So this is a for nice formula. Uh, then for any two indices i to j, um, this is a valid subarray if just p i zor p j equals k. Um, and this is the same thing as saying uh, p i zor k has to equal p j, right? Okay. So can you guys finish the, the solution now? You could have like a multi set and then. You just when you add a new element, you uh, you you have like an existing partial sum, like zor sum of the current array. When you add an element, you zor that element with the existing partial sum, or like zor sum, and then you look in the multi set to see if there exists uh, a pj when you zor it with k, um, and then when you delete an element, you remove it from you remove it from the multi set, and then you um, and then you update the Zor sum. So no, one thing here is that you don't actually need to uh, do any sort of updating or of the actual Zor sums. You can pre-calculate all the partial Zor sums already, and just use that. This this formula over here holds true. This this AI uh, AI to J is the Zor sum of that is equal to PI Zor PJ. Um, if, if you just globally beforehand make the uh, P array, and this will continue to hold no matter what your actual uh, Mohs algorithm range contains. Do you guys see that? Unless I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but uh, I think this is relevant. That, that, th that this sort of formula always holds, no matter if your range intersects with it or not. So then you just have an array storing how many of each you have. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, it's so weird. I was thinking this was subset, and I was just, like, so confused. Uh, my bad. I should have clarified what subarray versus subset. I guess it's the reason why Code Forces does that before every problem. I no, no, no. I, just, just, I probably just missed it by accident. Okay, yeah. So uh, uh, Andrew has the solution. Yeah. So we just... All we have to do is keep track of the occurrences of the counts of how many times each p value appears in the current in the current mo range. Right. Um, so then, for any value of x from p, all what we need to do is match it with x or k. Right. So we can use the exact same problem, exact same pattern that I mentioned from the last problem. Um, the sort of difference here is the formulas are just different. So the contribution here, as opposed to being like k sub s squared or whatever, is just the amount of times x showed up shows up in the current range times the amount of times uh, x or k shows up in the current range. Uh, one caveat here is that if x or k equals x, so this happens when k is zero, um, then the form then you have to sort of pick from the same bucket, right? So you're not you can't do count x times count x because that's not correct. Since you're picking from the same bucket, it's count x choose two. So it's this formula. Make sense?
Let me show you guys the code to make more sense. So we have this count array of how many times each value shows up, and then we have the tot, which is the answer, how, how many like how many subarrays in this current range work. And the way we do it is we update by we're looking at okay, we're adding position i, index i, and this is the d of adding or removing, right? So then uh, we, okay, this is the current value x that we're adding or removing, and other is what we need, sort of what we're matching it with, right? It's x or k. And so this is the formula for the contribution. So if x equals other, if x equals x or k, then we do the, the, the count x choose 2. Otherwise, we do count x times count other. And this is the contribution of x to the, to the number of valid subarrays. Then we update count x by adding or removing, and then we just add the formula back. Wait, just small question. Couldn't you like kind of shuffle around the uh, like input incrementing of count um, to remove the uh, if state inline if statements? Like have count plus equals dir definitely after the adding, and I think before the subtracting. Really, I'm not sure. Uh... Wait, how would that work? I mean, I'm just so much not seeing it. So you think move, switch the adding and subtracting? Well, I mean, like it, like it, like if you, yeah, I, th I think that would work. I'm not sure about the subtracting part, but for adding, like, because you're you're only going to increment count dir, like it, that that part is only going to matter if it's the same, right? Oh wait, no, never never mind. What am I talking about? Okay. 